Welcome to JMC Live. This is a special edition for Easter. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on that we want to try and cover for the different avenues known as Easter. We want to let you guys know the history of Easter, um, where it comes from, biblically and uh, a world's view, I, how uh, things have been changed to be more about a marketing tool for different people. And uh, I thought we would open up with letting you see the history of where where Easter actually is and, and the direction on what what God has actually done. We all know that that it was prophesied in the Old Testament there would come a day when a man would be born of a virgin and be the son of God and he would come upon the land and he would raise the dead, he would heal the sick, he would take care of people and he would open the door for God to have a relationship with with people on an intimate level beyond the high priest of the day because back, back, back in Old Testament times you would present your sins to the high priest, you would take an animal, uh, a, a spotless lamb, or a red calf, or whatever it was at the time, and the animal would be, you know, sacrificed upon an altar, and the blood that shed would, you know, cover the remission of sins, and there would be prayers given, and there would be a whole big event that would happen. Um, but what I'm thinking now is where we've come from. Where, where, where are we in 2010 compared to the Old Testament days, the New Testament days of Christ and His death and resurrection? We want to cover, you know, a lot of people according to traditions. Easter is anywhere within a 30-day window to be celebrating, you know, the death of Christ. And, and his resurrection. So today we, we symbolize Good Friday. Um, pagans call this day, um, and I'll paraphrase it into a, a way that you guys will understand, but they pretty much call Good Friday uh, their victory day. They believe that this is the day that they can do the worst damage they possibly can of any day because they assume that Christ is still in the grave or he just loses his power because this is the day he died but we all know that that isn't technically the truth and that isn't exactly how how it really works um, if you look at Luke 22 um, 14 through 20 um, it covers the Last Supper and typically on depending on what belief you have you may have a communion to go to, as they call it, or a Last Supper, or um, a rededication period. There's different names that people actually use to describe this, and they will take an unleavened bread to describe the body of Christ, and they will take wine or grape juice to describe the blood of Christ. And as you see in uh, Luke chapter 22, you see about the feast of the unleavened bread. You see, you see the blood, and, and you, you picture the big, the big picture, you know, of Jesus sitting there and all the disciples, and they're just having a good old time, you know. And then all of a sudden, you know, Jesus starts talking about, "Hey, this is, you know." This is my new cup. This is the covenant of my blood. And this is my body. And, and you know, eat this and remember me. And they're, and they're kind of sitting there scratching their heads like, eat this and remember you? Well, you're right here with me. Why do I need to remember you? He's like, aren't you going to be here? And, you know, I can imagine Jesus sitting there saying, how many times have I told you in private when we weren't around all these crowds that I was, I, w I came and I'm going to have to eventually die? I, I don't know how many times probably Jesus had to pound this into their heads because he already knew that they were all going to turn away. And he didn't want to give up. I mean, Jesus is the ultimate 
example of everything you're supposed to do as a Christian. So I'm betting every chance he had to explain himself that I am the Son of God, I have to die, I'm, I'm the only way for you to live, and I'm the only way you're going to actually, you know, understand and move into the direction that you're supposed to be. But too many people don't understand that even today in society, we become kind of like that. We become these, as they call Doubting Thomas, which is one of the disciples, that I just don't believe until I see the scars in your hands that you actually died and you came back. You know, a lot of people that go to church on a regular basis, Sunday, this coming Sunday, will be the biggest attendance for the whole year. Some people are having special events and bringing bands in and... and speakers and all sorts of things and they'll be covering the same thing that we're talking about <clears throat> but what I want to cover is a little more in depth than just the regular okay Jesus died and he came back to life and you need to believe that and you need to get saved I want to go a little bit more deeper than just the average message of what Good Friday and Easter is all about um, we actually have and I'm going to look at the science uh, behind a crucifixion. Um, no, the science behind his crucifixion. Well, well, his crucifixion. And this is technically <clears throat> what anyone that would actually go through a crucifixion. And some churches actually cover this. Um, they say that none of his bones were broken. Now, to describe this... The, these nails would probably remind you, if anyone's ever been to a railroad track, they'll have those big railroad ties. And they're, you know, an inch to three and a half inches in diameter, anywhere from six to ten inches long. So if you look, if you look at my hand here, some people say that it went through the bones in between the middle finger and the second here. But if that was completely true, which it is, it would eventually start to slide and rip through in between both of his fingers. The other theory is is that it was at the base of his hand down here and it was in between the two bones that they actually pushed the bones apart and pushed the nail through so therefore it could never slide out. His hand couldn't just slide off and he couldn't just fall off because I'm betting in the beginning when they started doing this they would nail someone to the, you know, the wood, and if they did it this way, their hands would be broken free, and by the time that finally happened, they would probably either have had enough, you know, adrenaline in their system, they might have been able to pull the stake out of a leg, and maybe got help. So they would start doing this through the, below the hand here. So then, therefore, you couldn't you couldn't break free from the bones. The bones would be stretched. The tendons would be broken. He couldn't open and close his hands. Mm -hmm. And because his hands were pulled back, like, pull, his arms were pulled back all the way, his shoulders dislocated, because for him to breathe, he'd have to actually lean forward. Mm -hmm. And each time he would do that, he would start to dislocate his arm more, because his arm was completely piled down. And the more he had to do it, that was how he was able to breathe, and breathe even more. Um... Depending on how hot the day was, and if uh, this was a normal, you know, this being a normal setting, uh, crows and birds and other insects and stuff might have been around as well. We're going to take a break, and I'll actually tell you more about the science behind a crucifixion. We'll return.